Hello and welcome to another episode of This Week in Metropolis. I'm James. And I'm the bald one. On this episode, we have Andy Robertson, who is an author. He is a um, journalist and a creator of Taming Gaming, um, which is a website resource for parents and also now a book. Uh, we chat with him about his career in the gaming industry, his love of gaming, and also how to cope as a parent with your children and um, being loving games as well. Yeah, not just coping with them. Um, we have to do that anyway. Being a parent, yeah. But yeah, but before we get into the latest episode, please uh, like and share the, uh, the 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 podcast on all different platforms. Make sure you leave your comments. Tell us what you think of the episode, uh, and don't forget to subscribe. Enjoy the show. Ladies and gentlemen, it is my pleasure to welcome you to. This week in Metropolis. Okay, welcome to another episode of This Week in Metropolis. And this week we are joined by journalist, um, author, the geek gamer, uh, geek gamer dad uh, on uh, Twitter and Instagram. He is the creator, I'm assuming is, is the right words, Andy. Um, for the uh, Taming Gaming database and book, um, and also the Family Gamer TV channel on YouTube. Welcome, Andy Robertson. Hello. I sound a bit like a busy chat when you <laughs> like that. You do. A lot busier than us. Um, <laughs> okay, nice to be here. F- thank you so much for joining us. Um, Andy, for those that don't know you, and, and I'll just fill in a little gap here, I actually discovered you um, through watching Ellie Gibson's um, Instagram page, where you joined her on a live show to talk about your book um, and the database. Um, but for those that don't know you, give us a bit of an insight into uh, your background. Yeah, so I've been a games journalist, so like there's some video games, um, ever since the Wii kind of was a phenomenon. Um, <laughs> I had a kind of a, a love of writing and I was writing um, online help for tax software. Wow. <laughs> Which is relatively, you know, it, it was <laughs> writing, but it had it is limited in how fulfilling it was. And so I wanted to find, I guess, a more creative output. So I had, I, I discovered that um, if you wrote about video games on websites that you could get sent games for free. I had this thing where somebody actually, it was, it was Nintendo Life, it's now a big site, and the guy who runs it was saying, I can't get anyone to review Madden on the Wii, you know? And I was like, oh, I'll do it. And so me and my mates got together, we played it, we took some pictures and I wrote up a review. And I was like, okay, where do I send it back? And they was like, oh, no, no, you can just keep it. And I was like, oh, okay. And so <laughs> that, that became next? like, yeah, exactly. The result, and so that became a bit of a um, a hobby, uh, and the and the added incentive was you could get a few free games. And so I, I enjoyed playing games, uh, and that that kind of ticked a few boxes and get, offered me some creativity. And I just kind of carried that on. Just uh, I think a lot of people kind of moved on from the Wii and kind of family gaming had its day, and I just kept on writing and thinking in this space. Ended up leaving the job with the tax software um, and just taking a risk and going full time. I think I thought I was gonna like get a, a full time job writing for a magazine that you know has a family of three kids and a mortgage. Um, yeah. So I imagined that would be how I'd pay it. Um, but I soon realised that most of the editors of those magazines were kind of in their twenties, probably in a shared house, and yeah. didn't have a family to support, and it wasn't going to yeah. pay the gonna pay the rent. So um, I just had to. I sort of started up my own site, um, and I sort of had to sort of duck and dive and find my way through it. And so over the years, I've I've had various projects. Uh, and I've been quite fortunate, I think, at different times in, in um, having opportunities to write for sites. I ended up writing for Wired. And that's almost my first gig. Amazing. <laughs> they, they had this Geek Dad blog and they wanted dads to write about tech. Um, and that's he- hence the Twitter handle Geek Dad Gamer. That's, it just sort of stuck from then. Yeah. Um, yeah, and so then that sort of wanders its way through a, a period in YouTube, which is really exciting. Um, and then more, most recently, I've kind of switched back to more kind of parent advice stuff in writing the book, which has been kind of the last three years. And, that, and then most recently, that's ended up in this kind of what was a spin off um, website for the book, the Family Video Game Day, mm. that has become kind of the main thing I do and is uh, like 1200 games, as, you know, loads of useful information and accessibility information. And yeah, and here we are today. So mm. there's a lot, there's a lot there, but that's kind of a potted, a bit of a potted history. 
What was the um, motivation for the, the sort of family support as such? So I've not sort of described that very, very well, but you know, was there an instance where you thought, oh, I really need, I need a resource of information for myself as a parent, or, or was it demand that you saw that there are a lot of parents out there that need guidance in, in, in that particular area? Yeah, I think all the way through, and it's still true now, that there's quite a lot of kind of muddled thinking. Mm. Not intentionally, just because we're kind of stumbling our way into this and there's a lot of competing voices. Um, and I think parents are going to get caught in the middle. Like we're expected to kind of make the most of technology, use it to help our kids get a leg up and sort of, you know, sort of upwardly mobile stuff and um, coding's the new Latin and all that kind of stuff. Yeah. <laughs> on the one hand, and we're criticised if we don't make those opportunities. And on the other hand, we're kind of bashed if we let our kids do too much screen time or play games which aren't the right rating. And kind of parents were in the middle and there's not, the, the debate goes over their heads. Uh, and yeah. just it basically, I you know, sort of scares them from both sides. Like either they're missing out on opportunities that their kids should have, or they're being too kind of lax, and their kids are going to be addicted to screens and are, are developing violent tendencies and yeah. gambling and all those kind of things. And so, right the way through, it's been it seems to be really well received. Writing something that actually is is addressing parents and the realities of what it's what's it like to have this console in the home. It's not like the sort of um, carefully crafted PR adverts that used to sell the Wii or like Xbox Connect when that was a thing. Mm -hmm. You know, it's 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 a it's a, it's a place where you have arguments, but then also it's a place where you can come together and have fun as well. It's like you know, it's like other parts of family life. Um, so, but it has its own challenges, and so that's been what's it, it's been exciting about writing in this space is that with a bit of information you can make a massive difference to a family. Yeah, um, yeah. and that kind of changes perspective and often conversations I have you know parents will come back to me sometimes literally in tears saying oh, I didn't realize you know I feel like I've got my boys back I, you know I, I hadn't thought about it this way but I was I was losing them to these games and now actually yeah. we've had these conversations where it's completely turned around so that's what kind of keeps me going I think there's those little I only, I only kind of hear of them probably once or twice a year sort of tip of the iceberg stuff but it's, it feels like a bit of a privilege to be able to do this and, mm. and and pay the mortgage, which I've managed yeah. to do. <laughs> Double win. Exactly, yeah. Do you think that it's the case now? I think, <clears throat> I know, I guess you get a, get to a certain age and, you, and you've seen the sort of cyclical nature of the press and so on. But I think it, you know, with games like Fortnite and things like that, it is almost that terror coming from, you know, the, the, the dark internet that's the, taking your kids away and all they want to do is do this thing. Uh, play Fortnite or whatever it may be but I often think well I remember when I was 12 same you know, where the age my oldest is now all I wanted to do was play Super Mario World and I would quite happily I was saying to James before this you know switch on the console before school I'd be ready and I'd have that like 10 minutes of oh I've yeah. got to do that that I was trying yeah. to do the night before and, and that thought was always there do you think it is um necessarily a modern problem or, or is it something that is that, that lure has always been there for children yeah i think it's just as it's as old as time really yeah. uh, whenever you've got new technology particularly new media and when that is being adopted and enjoyed by a younger audience there are always there's always that moral panic and if you in, in researching the book I, I went back and um, read some books about this and looked up myself and you find newspaper headlines worrying about the, the effect of the novel um, <laughs> on young minds and and, it, and particularly when it came out in portable form because people were going to be reading this, these books yeah. while they're doing other things um, and like would they be able to tell fact, reality from this, these fictional worlds and it was going to be damaging and then you can trace that on to like telephone addiction and teenagers not being able to speak face to face because they only have yeah. a telephone um, to, to radio um, and, and what happens is it that that technology doesn't become safer or change it just becomes familiar and then we sentimentalize it so when we think about radio it's like a lovely warm feeling yeah so I'm pretty confident that maybe 10 or so years time there'll be something new that kids are doing that we'll be worrying about and we will be saying things like why can't they just play Fortnite? Wasn't that lovely? Yes. They, used to, they used to compete and they used to talk and there was this whole world about it and they used to watch those videos. That was beautiful. Look at yeah. them now and there'll be a new panic. 
and then it will carry on. And it's not that things get safer, it's just that they, they get familiar. Um, and that's not mm. to say there's no dangers or there's, there's nothing we need to do about them, but it's good as a starting point to sort of realise, you know, this is what always, always happened. It's not new. Mm. Um, and and that's quite a relief, I think, to parents. It's like, yeah. oh, you can bring your side relief. This isn't just something that's blowing up now. This is what parenting is always like. Mm. Yeah, definitely. Taking it back uh, a bit, I was going to ask before, without seeing your background of uh, <laughs> arcade machines behind you, I was going to say, were you a gaming fan prior to, to doing your articles that you've done in, in journalism? What's your earliest kind of memories of gaming? Yeah, so I I was really into games growing up. So I, I had Spectrum Plus, which I was very proud of. It wasn't the Spectrum 48K with the rubber keys. It was this... <laughs> plastic keys <laughs> and then uh, enjoyed that I mean it would type in from Sinclair user type in these programs to sort of make the screen go funny colors and maybe even interact with it but not much more than that and then the Commodore 64 and then the Amiga was my real kind of coming of age and so I've got a warm place for that particular machine it's that it's funny how there's always two isn't it it's Amiga or ST in those days yeah um, which game on the Amiga out of curiosity were the Say again? Well, which games on the Amiga were the ones that sort of held a place in your heart at the time, do you think? I really liked the uh, arcade conversion of Rainbow Islands. Yeah. Um, Speedball. I really liked Virus. Speedball the... was incredible. Yeah. That's a game that I, 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 I'm maybe uninformed and it doesn't exist in a, a, a newer form, but I just thought that was uh, amazing. They, yeah. they should have at least a remaster of that sort of yeah. on the newer consoles. Yeah, there is a role of there is a role of skating sort of game coming up actually that's been long delayed. I think it's a Ubisoft game that is similar, and you have mm. to be, you sort of you have to have momentum and do that to the course. Yeah. So those sort of games, I really like Jeff Crammon's um, F1, <laughs> um, which is kind of you know before we got into um, you know the kind of cyclical F1 games, and yeah. um, and, and of course Kickoff. Um, I was again he got those two Kickoff or Sensible Soccer, and I was very much a Kickoff fan. And ran, I ran competitions in my local computer store where, you know, Amazing. people came we'd, we'd gather on a Sunday and do and have like a league. Um, mm -hmm. So, yeah, that was that was great. But then after the Amiga, I kind of fell off of it, really. I went to university. I still had an Amiga then, but I probably was on the wane. And I never really... Well, I, I tried to get into consoles. And actually, I imported um, a SNES. Um, from Japan before they were out in the US or UK and at the time I think it's about 300 quid mm. at the time it was loads of money I'm not sure how I afforded it I had a paper round or something I remember playing Super Mario World but I could only play it in black and white because this, the cable that came with the console mm. had a compatibility issue and I had to order yeah. one at the back of the magazine and I had to wait for that to arrive before I'd have the colour <laughs> so Super Mario World I really loved but then I didn't really I didn't really come back to it properly until the GameCube and me and some yeah. friends bought a GameCube together and got into like Time Splitters and um, some of those games on there, Mario Sunshine. Um, yeah, and and then I think and then I pretty much stuck with it because then I rolled into the Wii and I thought Wii Sports and still do think it's amazing. I'm still waiting for, for mm. them to do that properly on the Switch. Um, and I still, we still play Wii Sports Resort on the Wii U. Yeah. Um, big fan of the Wii U, and a lot of people talk about it as a sort of failed console. And it's commercially, it might have failed, but for families, it's in some ways mm. better than the Switch, and certainly it's a lot cheaper. It's a great way to play Breath of the Wild for about 100 quid. Um, and it and Breath of the Wild performs better on the Wii U than the, than the Switch in many cases, in many areas. So, um, yeah, so there you go, that's a kind of a <laughs> but, but I did, I kind of, I have always played, but it's, it's more recently, it's been I've always known about games, so. I am happy to write about anything and so I've you know it's it, the writing is kind of the thing and because I've become an expert in games um, that's what I write about um, but I don't I don't necessarily hold that role of the avid games are amazing kind of yeah. space. but there are certain games are very choosy that I would say is probably my favorite bit of media and I would yeah. choose like The Last of Us Part 2 and the first game I would choose over anything I'm a big fan of The Wire on on HBO series like that, but I think I still think I would choose that game over that series. So um, it's yeah, it's an incredible game. I've, I've got them. Um, 
One of one of the questions I had is um, regarding, and, and it's something you, you mentioned there uh, before about kind of screen time and things like that. I mean, I'm very conscious. My my um, eldest is only four, and when he sees me playing on the PlayStation, he wants to play, and and I. I He's played on the um, classic Nintendo with me as well when he was a little bit younger. And But I'm still conscious when he is playing on one of his sort of games that he likes, I'm conscious of the amount of time that he is. However, I don't have the same consciousness on my own time on a computer game. And, and me and Matt, again, have talked about this. There'd be times when me and Matt would be up playing Rocket League or I'd be playing Football Manager, which I'm a big fan of. And all of a sudden, I'd look at the time and it's two, three in the morning. I'd be like, God, what has happened here? I should be in bed. <laughs> Do you, are, are you as strict on yourself when it comes to gaming as, or, or are you not strict at all time, with screen I time? Guess, yeah. yeah, I mean, with, with with your children and with yourself, do you have the same sort of um, disciplines, let's yeah. say? Yeah, I am. Um, yeah, I think in terms of the kids, in, in terms of looking at screen time as kind of a thing that parents worry about, um, I usually try and sort of de-weaponize that phrase because it is this hook yeah. that everyone likes to hang everything on. Um, mm. And it's a really blunt tool because it's you know, screen time, particularly at the moment, screen time's everything time. Mm. So yeah. you know, a child could be just playing the same, could be playing Candy Crush for four hours and I'd be like, what a waste of time in, in some ways. And um, obviously there are, things, there are reasons to play that. Um, or they could be playing four or five different games with very different experiences. Some could have quite an educational like experience. Maybe they're playing a game with a grandparent or a sibling. Maybe they're playing a game that's got loads of reading and it's getting them into a particular sort of fiction and they're reading books about it outside the game. So it, I think it's just, just thinking about how much screen time is too much or too little is, is a bit of a yeah. misguided thing. I think it's context. Still, I yeah, guess. you need yeah. context, and your your ch- every child is different, you know. So some kids will be fine. Um, uh, but and in the book, um, you know, we do have a chapter on addiction and looking deeply at what the World Health Organization say about um, gaming disorder and the kind of the measures there, um, which is quite you know in the industry is quite contentious really. But as yeah. apparently it's quite helpful because if you read the criteria, it's really extreme so, to actually we often say, oh my kid was bloody addicted to Fortnite, you know. Um, we don't really mean they're addicted because yeah. that by the WHO criteria, you know, you have to be playing the game to the detriment of other parts of life. Yeah. Um, and it's seriously impacting. So you wouldn't be going to school, you wouldn't be family meal times, probably not looking after your personal hygiene. And then in terms of the criteria, you would then notice that someone would bring that up and be like look at what's going on and you would realize what's happening but you wouldn't be able to stop and you would yeah, still yeah. be doing gaming despite those negative income um, impacts um and you would be carrying that on in the criteria for 12 months before they get to say okay this is a clinical issue um and it's something you need to say and i'm not saying that doesn't happen but that yeah. I, I have never really come across anyone who falls properly into that criteria um and there are people but it's, it's a small a small percentage. I guess it would have to be unchecked for a considerable amount of time to reach that level. Yeah. You know, you, you would probably as a you, you would hope as a parent, you'd think in some of the early stages, you'd think, well, I, I think we need to, you know, rein that An in. Intervention. Yeah. Exactly. Well, a bit it, before they weren't yeah. watching and so on. <laughs> but yeah. It is, it, is, it is hard though, because it's the sort of thing which is incremental. And mm. so. You know, it just sort of, it, it, particularly if you're busy, I've got to go quite a bit of sympathy for parents who, who end up like, oh, how did this happen? And like, we didn't, yeah. we, he was just in his room. We didn't realize, I thought he was doing something else. Yeah. And there's that kind of, and again, part of the advice in the book and a lot of stuff I would do is about establishing games. Like, it sounds like how you look at them, they're, they're a part of family life. So they're kind of anchored as something that you mm. do together. So they might might happen in another room sometimes but they also happen in, in family spaces and so if something is exciting yeah. in a game then the child's going to tell you or equally if there's something that's worrying or, un- or unsettling in a game then that child would tell yeah. you and I think that's from the screen time perspective I think that's more the thing it's saying well if there is a ex- more extreme issue around screen time that's a really helpful kind of warning signal that there's some, probably something else in that child's life that isn't isn't in balance and, and probably they're using the games as a coping mechanism. So really the games are often yeah. the solution to another problem. And if we just solve that by just putting limits on consoles and just locking it down, 
I think as parents, we miss out on a really useful bit of information and, and uh, you know, a, a sign that maybe there's something we, that we know, don't know is happening in our kids' lives. Um, so I'm always keen to say, well, let, just let that, just live with this uncomfortable, uh, you know, long screen time for a while and talk about it, get involved in it because, because there's some really useful learnings about, you know, you have this insight into this part of your child's life that you might not otherwise have. Yeah, I, I think a, a good um, sort of example of part of that, particularly, and, and I'm sure a lot of parents have experienced it during lockdown and so on, particularly with, you know, really with my eldest, I, I saw it that where they weren't at school and they didn't have the, oper- uh, the opportunity to interact socially with their, their peer group, having Xbox Live and having their friends on there was was an absolute lifeline uh, at times because it was it wasn't even the, the aspect of them playing the same game together all the time they were in a party on the xbox and they were chatting you know and one may be playing minecraft and one may be playing something else or whatever mm. or they were having the, the shared experience in in one game but just to have that um contact was, was a, a huge thing and mm. and certainly the, the comparison between um, so sort of my oldest and my, my youngest, who is you know, who was sort of seven at the time last year, not all of his friends had that. Not all of his friends had an Xbox, and there wasn't that. Apart from the odd, maybe an interaction in the park, he didn't. He wasn't able to um, speak to his friends in that way, apart from a video call we'd arrange. And and you could tell the difference. You know, he would that. My youngest was really struggling without that interaction. Ben, uh, my oldest, was actually struggling, but to have that lifeline there, it was as an output. It, it was mm. a real, real benefit for him. And and you know, as as a parent, thinking, well, again, you were saying, you know, about the screen time, the purpose of this, you know, we might let you play a little bit longer than we would normally because it's that social experience that you're getting from it, which is such a such a benefit to you. Mm. Yeah, and I think it's important that you know we just acknowledge that the time we've been through, and we mm. can just we can kind of go easy on ourselves and on our kids a bit, yeah. and we'll you know we'll get back to some normality. But um, at the moment, there's lots of benefits that we're just starting to understand. And I think to to close it down too quickly would mean to be close those things down. Um, yeah. And it's, often that's important. Um, I didn't really answer your question though, James, about how much I play. <laughs> <laughs> I I am actually not that great at committing. to to play a lot of games so I'll pick a game and then play it a lot so I've played I'm on my third run through of Last of Us Part 2 um, but and I'm still playing Last of Us the first game I'm just working through it on Grounded which has been like a three-year project to try and get wow. through it because I'll get to a, a, like I just did the sniper stage it's kind of halfway through and it probably took me five hours just repeatedly doing it again and again mm. to try and get through because it's just one shot kill and it's so hard wow. Um, and you've got one bullet, you know, and I, I, I really enjoy it. So I'll find a game and I'll commit to it. Um, but I'm quite picky with, you know, what I'll, what I'll play. So I don't, I don't have that. Probably, I, you know, but I've still got like other screen stuff like phones and social media. I have to sort of try and do stuff to get off it. Um, yeah. Yeah. But I it guess is, it's difficult. No, I was just going to say, I guess, but with your profession as it is, mm. how do you avoid screen time in, in sense of writing and you know yeah. having a website and doing things like this it's it's omnipresent isn't it yeah course, and you see like you see, I think you, see, like, you need to have some boundaries so mm. um after after sort of working as a writer probably after four or five years i was just in one of the bedrooms in the house and i realized it was very difficult to leave work behind so i'm now in a, a relatively nice shed <laughs> in the garden <laughs> now um so uh, that means that i can I, I, you know i try and leave stuff here and if i've got work to do that i end up having to go back to the shed but it's very it's very clear both to the family and to me like yeah. oh yeah there's something i've got to go and do so there's a there's a barrier and that that certainly that certainly helped so brilliant so with regards to the family gamer tv channel on youtube that was yeah. the first was that the first project that you kind of when we think about that including the the taming gaming database and the the book was it the the youtube channel that was almost the start of where this all led to with the book um the youtube channel was probably one element of it but the nature of youtube like so the the 
So the nature of YouTube is you start with these high ideals. If I want to create, you know, content for families and it's like, it'd be like a little TV show for mums and dads telling them about games. And then you do it, which is my experience. And it's like, oh, this is quite, you get about 10 people watching. <laughs> and then, um, and then at some point you get, maybe, you know, I had this experience, you get, get lucky with some content. Um, yeah. So I ended up, I, because, of, because of the press writing, I was on a, you know, I was, had a, the privilege of being on a trip out to New York for the launch of Skylanders Giants. Um, actually, I've got some Skylanders here. Do you, do you ever play Skylanders? I've just yeah, been writing about them. My, so my can... oldest had Skylanders. Yeah. It's a brilliant game. Yeah. So I am. Um, I've just been digging them out because I'm like, it's time for a, re a remaster on the Switch. I've just been writing about them. Mm. Um, so I was out there for the for the press conference, and they had done the thing. Um, and because I've been tinkering around with this YouTube idea, I had a microphone I could plug into my iPhone. And back then, it was probably like an iPhone three or four, um, and a, that and a tripod. And I was like, well, I guess I might as well do something. I felt like a bit of a wally. It's the first time I'd ever filmed to the front of a camera. And it was all the other press going around and milling yeah. around. I'd put the camera up and was like, oh, hello, we've just seen the new Skylanders game. There's going to be bigger figures. And I don't know, just mumbled my way through it. And then did some filming of the actual figures and then was back in the hotel afterwards thinking, all right, I, I, I've got lots of writing to do. So I'll get a very quick rough edit of this up to YouTube and I can forget about it. Um, you know, be ready for the, the real work, which was writing for some newspapers. Um, and then I went, went for a meal in the evening while I was uploading, checked my phone, and I was like, oh, YouTube's broken again, because at the time it, it often did misreport stats. It says, like, my video's got 10,000 views, which is obviously ridiculous, because, you know, I would probably get a 1,000 people read my article in wherever yeah. it was in a newspaper. Um, but by the time I got back to the hotel, it had 20,000. And so it was this like, oh, what's happened? And so the, sort of the, the kids of the world had found this video and nobody else had done a video on Skylanders. And I happened to be early and then it got linked a few places. And so it was this kind of perfect storm. Um, so what had started as a project that maybe had kind of higher ideals really got sort of pushed and pulled around by the mechanics of YouTube about what's popular. And but but. You know, I'm quite happy to do that, and it's it's quite enjoyable. And I mean, you know, it's my job, so I don't mind chasing the money. So that's kind of what I committed mm. to to try and work out how how why did that happen? Could you how did you do it again? And that's yeah. a real challenge. You see a lot of channels that get one lucky video and then yeah. try and do it a few more times, and like, oh, it's not happening this time. What's going on? It's not yeah. right. Yeah. And so I ended up doing probably for the next two or three years almost a video every day feeding this machine to sort of build up this channel. And I had a great time doing it, and that. That took me into kind of covering more toys. So I ended up going to New York Toy Fair. And um, again, I had another experience where we had loads of, these loads of toys for a Disney show called PJ Masks, um, which is a little kids show. If you've got kids to the right age, yeah, you know very, it. very familiar with that. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and, and, and it was the, the, the toys were just becoming popular. And I did this interview with the CEO of E1 who was talking about the show. Um, and they sent some toys and I had this big box of them. I was like, well, I've done the interview. What could I do? I've got these toys. And it was summer. And the kids were young, young enough not to say no and complain. And I was like, why don't we do a treasure hunt? It'll be funny and I'll film you. We've got some outfits so you can get, uh, get dressed up. And so we yeah. did this very basic skit of them opening these um, toys and, the, and them appearing in the garden in kind of what is now typical. I realise it's a typical YouTube style. Um, and it just obviously struck a chord with kids again, um, but even more so. And so for the first probably few weeks, it was getting about 20,000 views an hour. Wow. And just carries on and still gets views <laughs> now. It's just like it's about forty something million views. The funny well, thing is that my that my kids are all dressed up in it as yeah. like the PJ masks because they were just about old enough. But now they're like sixteen, eighteen, and like well, why <laughs> is that video anymore? On the God, uh, take that down. Exactly. Yeah. And the fact the fact it's got lots of views kind of does insulate them from it because it's kind of it's it's sad and embarrassing. But what it's well, how come it's got forty whatever million views? Yeah. Right? It's what's amazing. I'm, I'm sure you've both been through. It. I mean, with with my boy, he would sit there and watch YouTube videos of of a similar sort of thing. I mean, I remember them being like an American family, but it'd be like an unboxing of something, and then the play. It was all like Thomas Thomas the Tank Engine toys, I think, and yeah. they used to get different ones. And he'd literally watch video after video, and I'd be like, "You just." Why don't you've got a load of them? You just can't play them. No, <laughs> yeah. no, I want to see what next one is. You know, <laughs> and it's it's amazing, like you say. I mean, once you find something that connects and you know starts getting the views and so forth, it is yeah. it is a bit addictive to then try and get. I mean, me and Matt have been trying for two years now with the <laughs> podcast. We're you know we just do the same thing every week. That, that's the 
We're, we're um, waiting for the, the, the herd to come to us. <laughs> yeah, they'll, ca- they'll catch on. <laughs> the, herd, the herd following. But yeah, yeah. I mean, it's 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 it's, um, it's amazing what what does connect. And and like I said, so from going into that and then finding these kind of family games because we we watched a few of the videos on there as well and finding games and I think these are a bit of a rarity now where a whole family can mm. get involved and I mean I, I said to Matt when I grew up I remember the first console I had was the Nintendo then I got the Super Nintendo me and my dad sometimes my sister my mum wouldn't touch the thing um, you know and, and if she yeah. did it was you know we just think, what's going on here yeah and even now well, like my wife when, when our boy's playing on the computer she'll maybe have a try and help him some way but I don't think uh, maybe I'm wrong with this I, I just don't think a lot of um, mums are necessarily interested in gaming as such but I'm, I'm probably <laughs> polarising uh, a, a large portion of people <laughs> there but we've, we've uh, from just my, lost 50% my, of our viewership yeah um, for, for, from, from my you know um, experience in, yeah experiences yeah it's just never been a kind of it's always been me and my dad or now me and my son or me and my brother and and that's kind of how i always think about is is it do you think them sort of games are a rarity now i think the ones that get like lots of advertising the ones that make a lot of money are the ones a a bit more you know they're more brash they're probably about shooting um Mm. because it's kind of an easier sell um but I think there are, and that's that's you know that's why I made the database because there's thousands of games that the mm. people of all you know ages, genders, walks of life can connect to. Um, but the, the the challenge is that you know we we've kind of let games become this thing that is just about entertainment um, and isn't about media. So I'll often be saying um, in like I'll be at a school doing a, a gaming thing. You know, sort of the similar sort of talk to this, maybe. And I, I will often, quite frequently, be stopped by mum or dad, who will say something like, "Oh, I like what you're saying. <clears throat> like, I know I need to engage with my kids, but can I just say I'm never going to play a game because um, I don't like shooting things, and they're for kids, aren't they? And I've got, no, I've not got time. And usually, the other mums and dads will be like, "Yeah, you know, why would you play yeah. one?" And they'll often, I, they have this loop then where I would say, "Well, well let's talk about it afterwards," you know. Um, and they'll come to me, and I've got these games that I'll use. For particularly for mums who've never played the game and who are saying that, or I'm like, well, why don't we try this? Come on a bit of a journey with me. And they're games which are kind of quite disarming because they're about topics that you'd expect, they're more like a Netflix documentary rather sure. than, you know, Mario and the castle and the princess. Yeah. Um, and I'll, and they'll usually play on the phone and they, uh, they're usually very cheap and they don't take very long to play. And so I'll often send off um, you know, that mum or dad with, with this kind of bit of homework and they'll play it. And they'll, like I said at the beginning, they'll, they'll often come back and say, oh, that game was quite, I never thought games could be like that. That was really mm-hmm. interesting, actually. It's, there's one game I use called Bury Me, My Love, which is about a Syrian refugee who, um, just, you play the, the role of her husband, and between you, you decide that the best course of action is for her to travel to Europe because her family's being killed. And it's like, um, it's a bit like a Tamagotchi in a way, mm. in that it's just like this virtual relationship, but you have it through text messages and so you're making choices, but you soon realise how you respond to her as her spouse affects her mood and affects, it affects her choices. And so she, her journey soon becomes this branching journey. It's about, there's about a thousand different routes or 20 outcomes. Um, and it really changes how you think, how you think about the stories. You know, I, I, um, when I talk about this, I'll often say, you know, I, I watch the news, I watch TED Talks, I feel like I'm an informed person. I know the plight of refugees, it's terrible, isn't it? But it wasn't until playing that game that the next time I saw a little boat trying to cross the English Channel, I was just in pieces because I had this proper connection to this person in this game that I had had done, and you can do it multiple times because there's lots of endings. So they'll often come back and say, oh, that was amazing, that game. as well as the game, what was really interesting is that actually my kids realised, uh, like, what are you doing, Mum? You're playing a game. What, you, what do you mean you're playing a game? Mm. And then I had a, a very different conversation. That's when their tone will change and they will say that phrase out here quite frequently of, oh, you know what? I didn't realise it, but I was losing my kids to these games. And I, I feel like I've got my boys back. Mm. And that's, they can, in their, in their saying of that, they hear themselves and then it can yeah. kind of catch up with them and become quite emotional. And yeah. that's really, that's what, that's what the book is trying to replicate. So, I'll just just to go through it so in the, it's kind of it's kind of in two halves so the first half is kind of the stuff we've been talking about 
kind of like device and it doesn't dodge the bullet so it talks about addiction and violence and gambling yeah. and stuff like that it's quite nicely laid out but the the back half is that journey into games and there the games are all laid out like recipes um so if i find i find what i was talking about so this is the game the game i was just talking about bearing you my love so you have a, that little overview that I gave just then, like the ingredients yeah. you need to play, a method, some serving suggestions that other people have enjoyed, and then something to follow other games. And there's just loads of those um, sort of games in that in that kind of that that back half to kind of try and help um, a broader set of people yeah. discover games that are suited for them, and to, and to sort of reframe what they think of games. And it's a quite a difficult thing to do because mm. it's quite it's quite well established that games are just for kids and they're just mm. about entertainment. But when they do, if you can turn that corner, then suddenly everyone's in on it. And I think it's quite important because you know, if you've got something that's, that's so essential, it is a big part of life, isn't it? Yeah. And if you've got one parent who feels like an outsider to that part of life, then they are they're kind of excluded from it, and maybe yeah. they don't even know what they're missing out on. And so, mm. you know, I think it's important to try to keep whittling away at that mm. and trying to figure out with them well, what would work for you or what could we play together or and that again that's where the database kind of comes in because it's got a much wider range of games and so you can pick themes and you can pick a console and how many players and you can sort of work your way around it so what, what came first what came first the, did you write the book first and then the website or was it the other way around or simultaneously it was so the book you know, the book was written first and it was a crowdfunded project so it's about three years um and i soon realized that i wasn't gonna get enough money with individual families i had about 100 or so 150 supportive families which is great but because it's a full color publication that the publisher wants to do we needed a, we needed to raise 20 grand and it was it was like, gonna take a lot longer um but we had the support of lots of industry people like xbox and roblox and um Peggy and ESRB and so it's Brilliant. down to those companies and organisations taking a risk really because the book's yeah. clear it doesn't dodge the bullet it's called Taming Gaming you know it's not saying yeah. games are great don't worry um, <laughs> it's game positive but it starts from a reality um, and yeah. so that that was a three year project and it was just about to be released and then we went into our pandemic and um, the printing became very very slow and so it was delayed and I had this window of like what should I do oh I guess I need a website and a friend of mine who runs websites is like, like you shouldn't you should just do a little database like those games in the back you can't search them can you so wouldn't it be great if you could search those 60 games so we did that we grouped them like they are in the back of the book into these kind of lists of like games that offer calm um, games that offer hope games you can play together games for mums and dads um, and that kind of struck a chord, I think, because of the time it was in, and yeah. it ended up on BBC Breakfast a couple of times. So it was like suddenly this, it, it was on the map, and then it, it that led into getting a bit of funding and sort of developing it into the resources now. So it was it's kind of it, it was an afterthought that's grown into something that's kind of the thing I'm I'd spend more time on than the actual book these mm. days. So it's kind of funny. Mm. It's such a fantastic tool, though, because I, one. I wasn't aware of it until we we started um, sort of researching for the, this the, before we spoke. But one thing which uh, I think it's not quite an equivalent, but it certainly serves a, a very similar po- purpose for me, is uh, on IMDb is the parents guide for for films, and, and quite often. Um, you know, my, my boys will say, "Can I watch this film? Can I watch that film?" And you know, if I've not heard, even if I'm sort. of some weird, weirdly like things like um some of the films i grew up watching some 80s films the 80s i i wasn't aware of at the time but it seems they were quite loose with their mm. um classification of, of yeah. things and pg would allow all sorts of you know yeah. swearing and, and who knows what else in it so that as a refresher going on imdb parents go and think really i didn't realize they you know, <laughs> yeah. referred to that whatever it yeah. was in there it's, it's quite interesting, and but for for games, although I've you know grown up playing games, uh, but it's the case of my friend, uh, my um, boys will come to me, and I've said this James for on a weekly basis, if not sort of more frequently, saying, "Oh, my friend's playing this. Can I yeah. play it?" And they're good. Yeah. They ask me all the time. And with things like Game Pass, you're, there's such an accessibility to games, you know, yeah. and. I, I, I'm being sound like an old man. Saying, well, why don't you finish that one? You know, you've just only just got this. Game. <laughs> but it's you know, you then have to do so much digging in terms of you know what, what, how suitable is it? What's it about? What's the 
you know, what what do you have to do and so on. But there isn't, or to my knowledge, there wasn't sort of like a resource that sort of hones in on that side, which is which is great. Hmm. Yeah. Have. Yeah, there were there were, there were bits like like because really when I was doing the book and this idea of a database, I was like, well, why? Let, let's not reinvent the wheel. This must exist. Yeah. So we went out and tried to find what we would like to point to, really, looking for a resource we could just refer to. And there are things like Common Sense Media, which is quite mm. American. But it's kind of a, lobby, sometimes. It's a bit of a lobby group. So they don't yeah. they don't support the main ratings. And so on that site, if you go look at like Watchdogs, you get their expert rating, which I think is like 18. Yeah. You get the ESRB rating at the bottom, kind of downgraded, which is 17. And then mm. and then they, they'll say, oh, parents, tell us what age you think it should be. Yeah. And yeah. that is often really low because they've got loads of kids pretending to be parents. That's quite low. <laughs> and then the other, the weird thing is then they say, oh, kids, tell us what age you, you should be. So you've got an 18 rated <laughs> game and they're like, come on, kids, play mm. the game and tell us what it is. And obviously that's really low as well. So you end yeah. up with four ratings that conflict. And mm. it... So it just didn't work and actually they've just paywalled their information as well so you can yeah. only look at a few every month before subscribing so okay. we realized that it didn't exist and, and actually and then we were like but it's, it doesn't exist because it's a lot of work and so we kind of came up with this streamlined way of approaching it as a database um and because of my background in writing and actually because of my background in writing like online help for tax software i was used to doing that laborious legwork it's just <laughs> now that people actually read what i've written whereas <laughs> the tax software they would just phone the help desk <laughs> <laughs> they wouldn't read my help um so it's kind of quite rewarding um mm. yeah and i could do you want me to show you yes, like, please do. Loop that we see like parents yeah. coming if i share my screen i've got it here so you can tell me if you can see that okay yes yeah so um that's the spring right yeah yeah so um um what will what will say so this is just the home page and we kind of we pull out lots of different things so, so just i guess to start that what i was mentioning earlier about these lists and it, you know just it didn't like this when we launched it but it was essentially the same sort of idea if i was down to the bottom with these are lists of games in different groupings so these are lists of yeah. games in the mental health area so for example the finding calm list was really popular to begin with where we just introduce the topic and then pick mm -hmm. out games which we or people we know have found been quite a calming experience and because it's a live list this these grow over time and you yeah. can kind of you can order them so maybe you want to you know see the most popular ones first or maybe you're like oh i, I want some calming games but my kids are quite young so you can pop into the filters and say okay well peggy seven and then i've got a switch so i only want and then you get not only a list, but one that's tailored to your family. So Carmen Games, yeah. 37. And, um, and so that that kind of was the, what we started as. And we, what we hadn't realized is as we got the data in, actually we, a lot of the kind of the, the landing pages of the games will be popular in their own right. So we'll see quite a lot of parents Googling, you know, is Call of Duty okay for a 12 year old, like you were saying. Yeah. And then they'll come to our page. Um, sorry, let me, um, yeah. They'll come, they'll come to our page um, and every every one of the thousand or so games on the site is laid out the same so you know that you're gonna you can find the same information and it's that kind of collate, collated presentation so we do some things which like a normal game site would find a bit weird like we only have one screenshot rather than those because it forces us to pick the single best screenshot that a parent should see that's indicative of the game yeah. and we have a single video that but that video is pre-watched by a parent turn the sound off and um, so you quick it jumps in here um so you quickly see yeah. you know quick information about a, a view of what the game would be like to play without having to wait through what then was about five or six minutes of kind of advertising at the beginning yeah mm. then we get we write an overview by hand for parents and we don't use jargon so we won't we won't even say platform game we'll say a running and jumping game yeah. Which some people are like, what do you mean running and jumping game? Like, are you from the like, 70s or something? <laughs> That's cool now, isn't it? But it's important, isn't it, that you know, we try and you know, avoid, you know, really think, well, this is, these are these mums that have never played a game or, or dads yeah. who never played a game. And then we can dig into the, actually the data behind it, like, or well, how long will it take to complete it? Can you play with people out of other systems? How many people we track costs? So we can uh, direct people to find the, the cheapest version of the, of the game. And if items are on sale, we can highlight it. Um, and then because we work with the ratings bodies, Peggy and ESRB, we, can, we have not only the rating, but also the examiner's report behind that. So 
you know, there's some considerable detail here. And it's not to yeah, shock yeah. or to put people off, it's to make an informed decision. And we don't make a value judgment. I wouldn't necessarily say that a 12 year old should never play Call of Duty. It's a parent decision, but I would like the parent to know what the game is like before mm, they yeah. say yes. But then the, the exciting bit is if you get to the end and say, okay, you're, you're only 12. I don't care if your friends are playing it, you're not old enough. Then at the bottom, because it's a database, all the games are related to 20 or so other games. And so this picks out the games of the same genre. So these are all shooting games, but they're ordered by Peggy rating. So you can have a very different conversation with your child. Like, well, you can't play Call of Duty. Well, but how about like Super Hot? Mm. Fortnite? Maybe, maybe not Fortnite. Plants vs. <laughs> Zombies is but fantastic. Two, yeah. Exactly. Yeah. It was like screen sheets. Fascinating. It's, what, it's yeah. a split screen game, but you can't see the other person. So you have to look at your, their screen to work out oh, where wow. they are. So it plays with that whole kind of, oh, I can see your screen kind of thing. Yeah. And initially kids will be like, oh, these are just going to be like educational games or not very good. But as they realize, oh, these are really good suggestions. And I've had mm. a really good time. Mm. The, the conversation changes in the home. And my kids, even though they're older now, will be like, oh, I've, I've got nothing to play. Can we go and spend some time and we'll find something together and that's kind of gold dust if your child is coming to you and saying dad what should i play i don't know what to play next rather than just like i've got to play this or that so that gives that gives kind of parents that i guess that you know that kind of knowledge that can be hard to get then the, the yeah. final final bit is that if you don't know what to play at all you can just come in and just search from scratch and um pick a peggy rating a console um, and because we track um, costs you maybe you don't know in detail what it means to have in-game purchases or loot boxes but you can say actually I don't want games with that because I don't understand it and maybe I, I like playing together I want to play four player games do your search and then you, you get your set of games you've got 76 here and then because because we had some funding because of that, that success <clears throat> we've been able to add all this kind of slightly overwhelming wow. set of um, accessibility fields so this starts quite simply if you've got a young child and you want them to play a game and they don't have to come and pester you to ask you what's happening you know pick a game with no reading <laughs> or maybe some parents use this to say well you can play a game but we want to find games that have got loads of reading so it's yeah. going to improve your reading age but then on into if you've got um a, you know a sight disability or impairment you maybe you need games with large text or high contrast mm. or, or or really good subtitles that you can change the size of and that are well captioned or maybe you want a game where you don't have to read and you know all the dialogue is going to be voiced you go around into like motor disabilities impairments where you can make sure you can remap buttons in the way that you need to yeah, um, you know if you've got audio that can assist what you're seeing on the screen right the way around and the one i often use in these kind of run throughs is the cognitive pressure so if you're um if you've got a child or you yourself don't want to be put on the clock if they don't get on with that then you can say these games will offer you a way to play at your own pace so then when, when you search then then it adds all those criteria together so it's now four or more players peggy 12 or under on the playstation 4 with low pressure accessibility yeah. and so it was quite a tight criteria so we've got seven games <laughs> but it's good to get seven results yeah. based on mm. that it's fantastic. we're getting more and more and then you might think well wait a minute overcooked that's not how can that that's not low pressure it's anything that's but low pressure. That's, that's really high pressure isn't but it? in the accessibility section um it then tells you well, why is it flagged like this because in the in the first games there was a uh, low pressure practice mode that you could play where you were on the right. clock and in the newer game that all you can eat version um there are more assist modes so you can actually tailor um right. what you've got and then again we we detail that on its own so it overcooked has every game has their, its own accessibility page which kind of goes through that and we'll pick out uh, overcooked's got lots of accessibility so it's not it's not suggesting anything else here but if if you've got an area where like in navigation overcooked's got three settings the database will try and find get similar games um, to some extent that offer more accessibility. So it's it's pulled out um, the what, Untitled Goose I'm Game sorry, as as a, as a potential <clears throat> because it's got more navigation assistance because it has that kind of pop up, yeah. you know, what to do next. Um, However, I it, did have to Google that I love that game. Yeah. When my son was playing it recently, I did have to Google how to get to the next level because yeah. you had to. That there's a path around the back and that you have to sort of skip through the fence don't you just yeah so that, yeah there's, that's kind of part of it isn't it that it's okay to look stuff up yeah. and like so, so in the overcook you know that it has fewer accessibility flags on a database for setting the controls and so maybe you want to find other games so radical relocation is another game that's got a lot of accessibility in the control area as moving out has as well um, and so you kind of again if you've got that that need of particular accessibility it will try and direct you to to similar games 
Where so does that kind information of... come from? The, so the sort of the, the pressure and the, the like cognitive pressure and those sort well, of things. Where, the where's details. that information from? Yeah, so it's only, I mean, it, it, that information isn't really anywhere. You know, mm. you can find it on individual sites here and there. And that's kind of what we're doing is just doing that legwork and working with so experts. compiling it manually uh, as yeah. such for the person. Yeah. But the only way to do that is to work with an expert or someone who has that particular yeah. impairment disability or requirement and get their expertise on it. Um, and that that's ena enabled us, um, I can show you the, the dashboard, um, to, to put together this really good set of criteria so they can then just come in and just check them. So this is the, this is a bit overwhelming. This is the full set of things that we look at on the database. So in difficulty, you've got a whole bunch. The numbers here are how many games have been flagged as having that. So if I whiz down, you get the sense that obviously this is a mountain we're climbing. Mm. There's a hundred, yeah, yeah. hundred different flags that we've got, and we're, all we're doing is flagging what someone might want to look for. So we don't we don't say this game hasn't got subtitles. We'll say this <clears> game <throat> has got subtitles that are large or that can be made large by a setting, so that you know if, you, if that's your requirement, you can click that that setting and then you're there. Um, but there's yeah, that's kind of like a lot of the database. It is it is that legwork of collating information that uh, when you start it's like why are we doing this because like <laughs> it's a mountain to climb and like you do a search you get like two results and you're like this is but now we've got you know close to seven thousand data points right. on accessibility it starts to suddenly make sense of like oh yeah this yeah. is really useful and we're seeing more and more of these accessing the database you know about six thousand a day now and um more more people get enthusiastic about the accessibility side so um yeah, and it's, you know, it's just uh, on this this type of part of it, it's just a privilege to be able to do something which seems to be making a tangible contribution mm. to this area and to and to benefit from loads of very generous people who come in, because I'm not an expert in accessibility, or I certainly wasn't when I started, um, and to, to sort of essentially be a resource for them. And so whenever mm. someone flags a game for accessibility, they're, they're credited at the bottom to say this was done in, in conjunction with whoever, whoever off Twitter, it automatically puts them in. Yeah. So, um, yeah, that's probably... Fantastic. Yeah. You can do stuff like... I could talk about this all day. One more thing, though. You can Because there's lots of, lots of parents visiting the site, we get a really interesting view of what's popular or what's worrying mm -hmm. parents at the moment. And so if you go to this popular tab, you can see the top games this week or this month. Um, and you see some games that maybe you wouldn't expect, like games like Rust or Phasmophobia continues to appear. And it's appearing here because parents are Googling, is Rust OK for my 10-year-old? Sure. How old should you be to play Phasmophobia? Um, and so you get a bit of an insight into, you know, it's, it's kind of nice really that you, the parents are seeing their child play something. Oh, what are you playing or what are you watching? Oh, it's phasmophobia, it's great. And then they're going off to Google, Googling it, and then we're seeing them pop up on our site. Yeah. Um, and so, yeah, it, it feels both ways. It's, it's a really nice window into what parents are worrying about, but equally, it's, it's like, oh, and this is, this is thousands of parents a day doing this sort of behavior. And you don't, you don't often get the sense that parents are paying attention in that way. And so that's yeah. been really nice to be like, oh yeah, we see, you know, thousands and thousands doing what you'd hope that they would do and engaging with this, this hobby of their kids. Yeah. We were saying this earlier. I think the difference when, when we were younger is that, yeah, I think a lot of these games, I know there were probably age range there, but Matt, you mentioned like Mortal Kombat and games like that when we were younger and the gore and stuff in that. I couldn't imagine my four-year-old or nearly five-year-old playing that now. Not that I'm saying you were five when you were playing it, but do you know what I mean? It's, I think- I was significantly older. <laughs> uh, <laughs> I was 18. Um, but do you know what I mean? Like, I, I feel like there was less um, kind of, not, not care's the wrong word. I, like I say- Less I, understanding, these, I think. Of, less of, understanding, but I think a lot of these games I'd be playing with my dad. I mean, you think like Grand Theft Auto was probably one of the first ones where I think, as a as an adult, you'll you'll probably know this more, Matt, because you had kids around that time when they were younger. Right. You would have wanted them not to be around when you're playing that. Do you know what mm. I mean? Whereas, Definitely. you know, when when we were younger, I, I think there was less worry about, and like you say, less understanding. But I, what I will say, Andy, is the website. I think it's fantastic. I think it's an mm. amazing achievement. And one um, certainly I'll be using. Hundred uh, percent. Well. I was just thinking, my boys, yeah. let's say, nearly five. Um, I, one thing I, I'm sure you would have seen them. Ellie was doing. Ellie Gibson was doing the weekly during lockdown. She was doing yeah. like a weekly game, and one of them was um, 
Island Saver, which is made yeah. by Nat West, or they're yeah. involved with it some way. And I told my boy about it, and I said, come, we'll get that. And he absolutely loves it. And I never thought, I mean, you know, I'm a huge FIFA fan and, you know, them sort of games. I thought, I'll, I'll put in the time, don't worry, I'll do this. And it's me who ends up playing it more, and, you know, he's <laughs> watching, he's going, Daddy, look, get that. Yeah. And, and these games that are like little indie gems, um, and, and I think one of my questions was, how do you keep up with the amount? Because, Matt, you're a big user of like Steam and things like that. And I know there's tons of independent games coming through on that. Do you have to kind of keep an eye on everything that's coming out or is it quite selective? I think because it's such a strong community, the, the, the stuff that's interesting bubbles to the top. So there's some various accounts I follow, like Get, In, Get Indie Gaming is one, a YouTube channel, and Wholesome Games, and various some various sites that do quite a good job at surfacing up and coming games. And and then on Steam, it's just paying attention to what's bubbling up because you just want to be early so that you can then yeah. obviously get a bit of traffic. So Valheim, yeah. we were really early on and got good traffic. Among us, I saw that bubbling up in, in our Google results before it became popular, so we added it. And actually, when we added it, it was a Peggy 16. And so, um, as it says on the page, on our yeah. database, we got in touch with the VSC. We're like, are you sure this should be a 16? Like, mm. I think it's not been looked at properly. Yeah. Uh, and they reevaluated it and it turned into a seven. And so, <laughs> kind of being part of that kind of conversation means you just, you hear about games. And I guess the yeah. other thing is committing to only adding games, which either are important for parents to know about, or the games that we want them to discover. So yeah. we're not trying to add every game. I'm, I'm relatively resistant. If the, if the game hasn't got something unusual about it or isn't hugely popular so parents need to know about it, you know, yeah. I, kind of, I have to have a reason to add it. Um, and once you're in this kind of the swell of it, you know, because people use, start using your database and like, oh, have you thought about adding this or that? And any time someone tips me a game, I'll always spend probably five minutes assessing whether it's good to add and if it is, yeah. We can add it pretty quickly. It's probably about about an hour or so for me to add a game now. Um, so, but it is it, it's amazing that you know I've got I've spent a, a year and a bit adding games. We've got twelve hundred games, and I still come across older games that are just amazing that mm. you know I hadn't heard of, uh, and then new games. I've always you know, it's, it's it's always nice to have um, like you know just there's just so many interesting games that you can just pull out. Yeah. One, one I've just been just been talking about a lot is before your eyes. Have you if you have you seen no, that? No, what's that? I think I've heard of it. So it's it's a it's a game you play and you use a camera, and it's a exploration game. And so you're taken back to the start of someone's life. You play in first person, and you can, it's kind of like a walking adventure, but you don't actually move. You just you look around each scene with your mouse, and and the game moves through the time of their life, and there's some trauma that happens, and so you're working through that. Um, what's interesting is you don't click you just move, move the mouse and to interact with something you blink and so you oh, move wow. onto something and then you blink and then it interacts which is great that's quite a nice novel way mm. um, but what's fascinating is then every now and again you'll be in a scene you'll be kind of feeling like oh, i'm halfway through doing this and suddenly this metronome will appear and that means if you blink the game will go forward to the next scene and you'll miss anything else and so you have this thing where you're oh i'm not Certainly. finished <laughs> i can't not blink Oh God, you know, so and, and you're trying not to, and eventually, competition. eventually you do, but it, it's really clever because it uses that inevitability of having to blink with this, you can't, you can't stop time going forward and life yeah, you yeah. Know, is carrying on, it's not in our control. And so it's just this beautiful idea that's really simply executed by this kind of theatre company really from New York, so I ended up speaking to them, um, but does something in the game that any adult you described that to would be like, oh, that sounds amazing. Mm. You know, let me give, I'd love to have a go on it, you know. So mm. it's having those little kind of games in your back pocket yeah. and getting those out in front of people is just, it's just really rewarding. So I, yeah, that's kind of the thing that kind of keeps me going. And each, really each record that we kind of see like a little love letter to the games, to the, these people who've made these, who've spent, you know, lots of time and often lots of money creating yeah. a game, which sometimes can easily get lost or, doesn't get its moment in the sun or the kind of the mm. Twitter decides it isn't it's a six out of ten and so it kind of ends up in in the bargain bucket. <laughs> mm. So uh, coming full circle do you still get sent free games? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I think really if, you, if you've got a website that's you know getting a few thousand people a day you'll 
you, you'll be on the you'll soon be on the radar of a PR yeah, yeah. Um, sort of company. Yeah. Um, yeah, and that's you know, and what what I will do, I have like a, well, a quite good network of families now who who will play and test the games, and so you know, any any game um, we get sent, we'll give it a good look at it, and you know, unless there's a reason really not to add it, we we'll probably will add it. So. Um, mm-hmm. Yeah, and it's and I still count it as a real privilege, you know, getting mm. access to these games. And I try and always keep myself remind myself that the cost is a barrier, which is why on the website we've added the the pricing um, for every game, and you can order the results by price, and it tracks um, discounts. And it we, we just we, we just just fine tuning it. It's pretty good at, at tracking subscriptions to like PlayStation Now and Game Pass, so you can find you can pick Game Pass and then look at the popular games in in there. Obviously, yeah. they'd be free if you're subscribed. So, I'm trying. To, yeah, although we do get freebies, I try and keep in mind that um, uh, you know that's that's a privilege, really. Mm. And we and also at the mm. moment, as you'll see on the site, we we get the chance to advertise some games as well. And on the site, there's a, there's a, a link on the on the corner that's very trans. You know, it it is it, aiming to, for us to be transparent. Of like, yeah. we don't want to have Google ads and kind of lots yeah. of adverts making it a busy space but we will work with publishers who who create appropriate games that we think are a good fit and that's how we're funding things um but still it's a it's a loss making project at the minute but um but i'm pretty confident that it's going to be you know a nice little business mm. you know in the, years, in the years to come which is why i'm kind of p- plowing time into it <laughs> it's fantastic thanks have you got any more questions about no no well Andy, where can our listeners and viewers find you online and your website and so forth? Yeah, so so the book Taming Gaming you can get on Amazon, and there's a there is a it's discount at the minute. I think it's like about thirty or forty percent off, and it's because it's in hardback. Um, I, I guess we'll do a paperback at some point. I'm waiting for the publisher to sell me that. You can get it on Kindle, but it's again cheaper. Um, uh, you, the, the database is taminggaming.com. Uh, there's the, there's the first chapter of the book on the on that same site. So if you just click on the book link, you can read the first chapter for free in the forward to give you an idea of what's in it. Um, and the, the, on Twitter, it's Taming Gaming DB. But we do, we do we pick a theme every other week and then find games and we'll write a piece of content. Usually, one of the, one of the mums we work with writes some content for us, and then we pull out games around that theme and, and some lists. So it's worth following. Um, and also, I'm Geek Dad Gamer on Twitter and I'm always happy to answer you know any questions whether that's like my DMs are open so I'm happy just to I'll have parents just pop up and be like oh my my boy won't stop playing this or that what should I do and I'm quite happy just to have it I'll be like let's jump on the phone and the, people are so surprised oh you're like a real person I can just talk to you <laughs> but I learned so much just talking yeah. having you know conversations yeah. like this or just talking to people I think if you and that's something I learned from YouTube that it, people say don't 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 read the comments but some of them my best video like that video that has now got 40 million views on youtube is because there was some kid who commented saying oh i liked your interview but why i just want to see more of the toys and i saw that and was like oh yeah it's probably true you probably do don't you and then did a video and so in the same way i just try and pay attention to conversations what, like this what is they want to want to see or hear i guess yeah yeah, yeah because it yeah. you know that that's that's who we're serving isn't it so um, exactly you can only know so much. And my, my kids are getting older now. Um, you know, they're in sort of 18, 16, 14. So, you know, the kind of the, the, the sort of some of the issues that parents will be facing today will be a little bit different. So again, I should yeah. pay attention to that. Definitely. Well, we'll put all the links in the videos um, on, on our profiles and pages and so forth. Um, but for now, thank you, Andy, for joining us. Great. Thanks a lot. It's great. Well, I hope you enjoyed that as much as we did. Don't forget, if you did enjoy it, please um, like, subscribe on whatever platform you're watching and listening on, because in that way you won't miss out on any future episodes we put out. Yeah, and don't forget to follow us on all social media platforms as well. We're on Instagram, Facebook, Twitter. Um, and uh, yeah, give us a follow and uh, you'll be able to keep up to date with all of, uh, the latest uh, episodes and posts that we um, put out there. But thank you for uh, listening and watching. And we'll see you next episode.